We've become accustomed to seeing stealth aircraft now for almost 30 years, from the F-117 Nighthawk to the B-2 bomber to the F-35. But what about helicopters? They're an integral part of the military, but the majority of them are hardly what you would call stealthy. And ever since the advent of radar-guided and heat-seeking missiles, they've been more vulnerable than their faster fixed-wing cousins. Although we've had hints of a Black Ops stealthy helicopter with the Radon Bin Laden's compound in 2011, there isn't a rotary equivalent of the F-35 in service. But one was developed over 20 years ago, and its mission was to do then for helicopters what the F-35 has done today for fixed-wing aircraft, with stealth, sophisticated battlefield electronics, advanced network sensors, high performance and firepower. Even though it was praised by the military, just two prototypes were ever built. This is the story of America's first, and so far last, stealth helicopter, the Boeing Sikorsky RAH-66 Comanche. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. The story of the Comanche starts back in the early 80s with the US Army looking at replacing the OH-58 Kiowa and the OH-6 Cayuse scout helicopters with something more survivable but also capable of attacking lightly defended targets. Attack helicopters had come about during the Vietnam War when gun platforms had been fitted to the Bell UH-1 Iroquois or the Huey to give them some form of protection when flying troops into battle, but it soon became apparent that a dedicated platform would be required to make a true attack helicopter. The first attempt was the 1962 Bell Model 207 Sioux Scout. This introduced the key features of a modern attack helicopter, the tandem cockpit, chin-mounted gun and stub wings for weapons. Whilst the US Army liked it, they thought it was too small and underpowered. Bell replied with the Model 209 AH-1 Cobra, which used the same engine, transmission and rotor systems as the Huey. The AH-1 Cobra was light, manoeuvrable and effective, but lightly armoured, and was susceptible to enemy fire, which in the mid-1970s led to the development of the McDonnell Douglas Apache AH-64 as a replacement for the Cobra. This was more like an airborne tank, very well armoured, with a wide array of weapons available to it, but it lacked the light manoeuvrability of the Cobra. By the early 80s, the US Army was looking for a light attack and reconnaissance helicopter, but one which could be heavily armoured and use stealth technology to defeat more sophisticated radar and heat-seeking missiles, allowing it not only to act as a forward scout for the more heavily armed Apaches, but also attack smaller targets when it found them. This resulted in the LHX, or Light Helicopter Experimental Programme, but as a portent of things to come, this took nearly a decade to come to a conclusion and award the contract to build the prototypes to Boeing Sikorsky in 1991, with a development budget of $2.6 billion. 1,200 were to be built at a cost of $28 million each. The program was going to be the next generation helicopter and would introduce advanced new and untried design features. This would take the stealth knowledge gained from the previous programs like the F-117 Nighthawk, as well as introducing the concept of the digital battlefield, using network sensors to instantly transmit the location and strength of the enemy back to mobile headquarters directing the battle. To do this, many new technologies would have to be developed. The fuselage, for example, was a composite made up of 350 parts, a big reduction compared to the 6,000 plus parts for a normal metal helicopter of a similar size. It used the flat faceted construction first seen in the F-117 to reflect radar signals away and was coated in radar and infrared absorbent materials, which reduced the Comanche's radar cross-section to 360 times less than that of the Apache AH-64 and even half that of a Hellfire missile, allowing it to get up to five times closer than an Apache before being detected. To help reduce the radar cross-section, the wheels and weapons, including the chin-mounted Gatling gun, retracted into the body, which also had the benefit of making it more aerodynamic and faster. 
It was constructed with Kevlar and graphite armour, which could withstand heavy machine gun fire from up to 23mm shells, and it would also be more crash resistant. As helicopters operate closer to the ground and at slower speeds than attack aircraft, the first thing that most people know when one is approaching is the loud chop 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 sound from the rotors. This is caused by the interaction of the airflows between the main rotor and the tail rotor. So on the command sheet, the tail rotor was an enclosed ducted fan to reduce this airflow interaction and help reduce the sound. This was also tilted over to be less radar reflective. The tail ducted fan was also very powerful and along with sophisticated control systems, allowed the helicopter to change the direction at which it was pointing whilst it was traveling in a straight line. The effect of this was that it could fly sideways at speed or even backwards and aim its weapons without having to change course. It also had the benefit in that the tail fan blades would be protected during low level maneuvers at night and when flying at treetop level, a time when it's difficult for the pilot to see obstacles like tree branches, something that could damage normally open tail rotors and bring down the helicopter. The composite fan blades were also able to withstand hits from 12.7 mm rounds. To further reduce the sound, the main rotor had five composite blades, downwardly canted, which had less of a regular beating sound and more of a hum to it, which was about half the noise of a regular helicopter and could blend into the background better. To defeat heat-seeking missiles, the engine exhaust from the twin T-800 turboshaft engines would be channeled along the tail and exit by the fan, where it would be mixed and cooled by fresh air from the fan. The powerful engines and streamlined body also made the Comanche very fast, with a top speed of 320 km per hour, 201 miles an hour. The Comanche had extensive electronic countermeasures and fire control systems, including a second generation, long range, forward looking infrared sensor to spot targets, which could then be illuminated with a laser to guide missiles. It could be fitted with the Longbow millimeter radar based on that of the Apache above the rotor to look over hill crests and trees. Data from these and other sensors could feed into the automatic target identification and tracking system and also be forwarded onto others in the force, a bit like the F-35 does now to provide near real-time intelligence. The crew also used helmet mounted displays and night vision system with separate crew cabins which were sealed against chemical and biological attack. The triple redundant fly-by-wire flight control electronics were also fault tolerant so that if part of it was damaged in an attack, backup systems could instantly take over. The first prototype started flying in 1996 with the second joining in 1999, but as development and tests went by, more and more problems started to crop up. The sheer number of new systems and technologies being brought together in one aircraft meant that Boeing Sikorsky were playing an increasingly costly game of whack-a-mole, trying to iron out the problems which weren't helped by the army, shifting the goalposts and adding new feature requests. The army wanted more weapons, so stub wings were added with hard points for more missiles, but this then made it hundreds of kilos overweight and less aerodynamic, but no one at the time had figured this out until it was actually loaded with weapons. The Comanche was also far more reliant on software for all of its systems, but this was proving to be very buggy. Sensors were unreliable and the radar absorbing body was susceptible to corrosion from rain. All of this, the changing requirements and poor management slowed the project, causing cost overruns, which ended up tripling the development costs. One example was the Army's request that the range of a helicopter, which was designed to be a scout, be raised so that it could be ferried across the Atlantic. And yet it was designed with a narrow body so it could be more easily transported by plane or ship. As the cost went up, budget cuts from the so-called peace dividend after the fall of the Soviet Union put more pressure on the program, which was designed to fight a war against an enemy which no longer existed. So large numbers of reconnaissance helicopters were seen as no longer necessary. Afghanistan and the war on terror moved the focus away from the Cold War era design goals, even though other stealth and UAV programs were given more money, but the stealth helicopter was seen as a niche project. 
over the lifetime of a program, the total number on order was gradually cut more and more, which meant that the unit cost of each one went up more and more, which emboldened the project critics to push for even more cuts, saying that they were now too expensive. In 2002, it was estimated by 2008 the Comanche would be taking up 40% of the Army's aviation budget, money which they said could be better used in funding development and renovation of existing helicopter fleets. But in 2004, the Comanche project was abruptly cancelled by the Army. The development costs had risen to $6.5 billion and the cancellation fees to Boeing and Sikorsky added another $500 million to the final bill. So like many other forward-thinking programs, the RAH-66 Comanche ended up as another museum piece, with both of the prototypes now located at the US Army Aviation Museum at Fort Rucker in Alabama. Time will tell if a future stealth helicopter will see the light of day in the US, or maybe other countries might be looking into taking on the challenge to create the world's first operational stealth helicopter. One of the feature requests was for the Comanche to control UAV reconnaissance drones, which ironically helped hasten its cancellation because it was realized that they didn't need the Comanche to act as a sort of data middleman. And as drone technology advanced, they could be controlled more directly from regional headquarters. The future of UAVs and helicopter drones will need skilled people to design, build and operate these new aircraft. And our sponsors of this video, Brilliant, can help you understand the skills required. Brilliant is a fun problem solving website and app so you're not tied to the desktop and you can help develop those learning skills anywhere. Research shows that doing problem solving is more effective than watching a lecture. Brilliant's approach is based on this active problem solving and learning method. It's about seeing concepts visually and interacting with them so that you remember them. Their courses are laid out like a story and broken down into pieces so you can tackle them a little bit at a time. There's no big deal here, there's no grades, there's no tests. And if you make a mistake, you can just check out the explanations to find out more. Brilliant has something for everyone, whether you're looking to start with the basics of math and science, or dive into things like advanced neural networks and quantum computing. So if you're looking to support Curious Droid and join a community of over 8 million active learners, you can get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in-depth courses and learning by heading over to brilliant.org forward slash CuriousDroid and following the sign up link. And to close the video, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of our patrons out there for their ongoing support.